Good morning, everyone. My name is Jan Sveinar, and I'm glad to uh, welcome you on behalf of the uh, Center on Global Economic Governance here at Columbia. Uh, the event today is uh, certainly coming at a critical time in discussing uh, the way forward for the U.S. political and economic uh, system. As you all know, income inequality has been given a lot of renewed attention in the public dialogue among policymakers, academics, economists uh, around the world. And the discussion today will in fact highlight uh, the trends in increased income inequality and political polarization uh, that has mutually reinforcing issues uh, in the world. Uh, we have a great set of uh, panelists who will raise important questions on campaign finance, uh, changing labor market issues, and the uh, country's current electoral uh, process, among many, many others. So without much ado, let me introduce the distinguished speakers today. We'll start with my left here with Howard Rosenthal, who is professor of politics <coughs> excuse me, at New York University and research fellow here at the Center on Global Economic Governance. His areas of interest include political economy, American politics, political methodology, and comparative politics. He has published several books, including Political Bubbles, Financial Crises, and the Failure of American Democracy, and Polarized America, The Dance of Ideology and Unequal Riches. Uh, next, we have Sharon O'Halloran, who is uh, the George Blumenthal Professor of Political Economy and Professor of International Affairs here at SIPA. She's a political scientist and economist uh, by training, and she has written extensively on issues related to the political economy of international trade and finance, economic growth and democratic transitions, and the political representation of minorities. Her work focuses on formal and quantitative methods and their application to politics, economics, and public policy, and her publications include Politics, Process, and American Trade Policy, Delegating Powers, and The Future of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, also present with us today is Wojciech Kopchuk. He is an associate professor at SIPA and the Department of Economics. His research focuses on issues related to tax policy and income and wealth inequality. His most recent studies include analysis of the role of social networks in tax avoidance, understanding tax avoidance related strategies to closely held firms, and understanding the evolution of inequality and mobility in the United States. His work has been published extensively in top economics journals, including the American Economic Review, Journal of Political Economy, and Review of Economic Studies. And on the very far left, your right, is uh, Joseph Stiglitz, who is the university professor at Columbia and co-founder and co-president of the Initiative for Policy Dialogue. In 2001, as many of you know, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics for his analysis of markets with asymmetric information, and he was also a lead author of the 1995 report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which shared the 19, uh, sorry, 2007 Nobel Prize. Uh, Joe was the head of the President's Council of Economic Advisors during the Clinton administration, was a chief economist and senior vice president at the World Bank, and has the author of uh, numerous publications, the most recent publications including Creating a Learning Society, a New Approach to Growth and Development, and Social Progress and Free Fall, America, Free Markets, and the Sinking of the World Economist. So we have a terrific panel here. Each panelist will take about 15 minutes to uh, present his and her thoughts, views, and then we'll open up the floor to discussion. Thank you very much, and we'll start with Howard. Thank you very much, and uh, also I want to thank the center for hosting me here at Columbia uh, this spring. Um, so, oh, I just turned it off. Okay, which way do I go? Okay, that's fine. Okay, so um, I've been spending a lot of the spring. Um, with my co-authors doing a second edition of this book, Polarized America. Uh, it'll be out later this year, uh, and I'd like to tell you a little bit what we learned in the past and what we learned from 
an additional 10 years of data that will be uh, in the book. So, uh, you know, both political polarization and economic inequality have accelerated into uh, record territory since this book was first published in 2006, and money is poured into campaign finance at unprecedented levels. Immigration has turned into a hot button issue. Uh, Non-citizens continue to represent a substantial fraction of the adult population. Government policy impeded by polarization and gridlock has left income and estate taxes at relatively low levels. And the intent of the Affordable Care Act to reduce health care inequality for the poor has been blunted by the refusal of most red states to expand their Medicaid programs. In large part, America today is what it was a decade ago, only worse. In the last two elections, those of 2012 and 2014, show, however, a weakened connection of income to voter behavior and to congressional representation, although raw income stratification of voters is greater than ever, as is the relationship of county median income to voting. The economic position of the median voter, for years maintained by the rival of non-citizens at the bottom of the income distribution and by low participation of poor citizens, has eroded. And the changes could conceivably be short term with low income Republican voting by poor whites and higher participation by non-whites, both being a response to an African American president, or they could be long term with politics being permanently distorted by the campaign contribution and lobbying of the plutocrats. Okay. So um, polarization, um, and I'll sort of tell you technically in two sentences what it means shortly. It's probably linked, uh, without saying what's cause and what's effect, to income and wealth inequality, to immigration and citizenship, to financial and other kinds of deregulation, and then just to pure changes in ideology. You know, no government, no taxes, no abortion, no climate change, no inoculations. And since I spent time in San Francisco, I have to say no male circumcision. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the policy consequences are you know, low minimum wages, low estate tax, many other things, and limited adoption of the Affordable Care Act. Okay. So, you know, the media now, this is from the Washington Post, they just take the, this thing, sort of thing as facts, and what they're doing is pulling numbers off of uh, the Piketty and Says websites and our website, and then doing their own graphics, which I don't find very interpretable. So let me show you some different graphics. Um, and uh, without worrying, uh, so we're gonna show you a bunch of things that kind of all kind of bottom out at some point in the middle of the last century and then have accelerated since. So this is the curve of the income share of uh, the top 1% and the index of polarization in the house. So what is polarization? It comes from um, a scaling into one dimension of roll call votes in Congress. And what you're seeing is a difference between the mean position of Democrats and the mean position of Republicans. And, um, you know, curves look different if you do s different things technically. The good news is that uh, when you do this from campaign contributions, um, so you, now the two things you're dealing with are individual contributors and politicians, you get the same answer and you find that polarization is actually increasing and that polarization of, of, of contributions is actually increasing much faster than polarization of Congress, okay? Um, here's a sort of story, a long run story, where you're plotting the percent foreign born, which uh, plummets because of restricted, restrictive immigration legislation in the 1920s, and then opens up uh, when legislation is passed in the 1960s, okay? Uh, and so, oh, let me go back here. So, you know, most of the story about polarization as it's conveyed by us and by the media is that it's Republicans moving to the right. And Republicans certainly have moved to the right on economic issues, but you could also argue that the Democrats have moved to the right. After all, the Commodity Futures Modernization Act and other types of legislation were endorsed by Democratic administrations, okay? So why haven't the Democrats sort of just tracked to the right also, which would have, you know, we just moved to the right and 
in the country would be no more polarized than it was. Well, I think the story is told aptly by this cartoon that appeared in the New York Times a week or two ago, uh, in which the, there's been an issue of you know, changing who appears on the United States currency. And the cartoonist on a million dollar bill put in Sheldon Adelson, who is the largest contributor in the 2012 elections. And on the $20 bill, Andrew Jackson, a white slave owner, was replaced by an ex-African-American female slave, Harriet Tubman. And, um, and this is basically identity politics uh, has been a part of the democratic agenda. And some sense of this was put together some time ago by uh, John Gehring, a um, political scientist at Boston University, in which he looked at the party platforms of uh, the Democrats and looked at how much they were devoting to social welfare issues. The curve stops in 1992, but that, remember that Bill Clinton's first act as president was gays in the military, not economics. Okay, so what are some of the policy uh, consequences here? So minimum wages, probably most of you have seen a picture like this. Uh, wages went up and coverage was expanded uh, again sometime into the 1960s and then it's fallen and although the reason for this sawtooth pattern is that minimum wages are not indexed and uh, now they're, they're well below their peak in the 60s and even though many states have adopted their own minimum wage laws, the highest one is only around $9 an hour which doesn't get us back into the 60s. Uh, the $15 an hour that people have been asking for recently would get us there. Um, and another nice picture is the estate tax where I, the heavy black line, I flipped the tax so, so it looks like the other pictures. And uh, there's a long line here in the middle which tells us something that the status quo can be really important in American politics. Those are the Roosevelt tax rates and you know, so the maximus tax rate was 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 very high um, from the 1940s to the 1970s, 77 percent, and then it uh, gradually gets reduced. And of course, the minimum estate um, subject to uh, uh, estate tax has just uh, skyrocketed in recent years. Okay. And lastly, let me just show this slide about uh, Obamacare in the 50 states. Um, so what, is, what does the partisan differences make? Uh, so there, there are two policies. One is whether you adopt the federal exchange and a state exchange. Uh, states that are uh, controlled by Republicans have almost totally not implemented state exchanges. Uh, states that are controlled by Republicans have been much less willing than states that are controlled by Democrats to expand Medicaid. Okay, I, we didn't start on time and I don't know when I, how much time do I have? Anybody? Okay. Um, and here's one more of these U-shaped curves. This comes from um, uh, Philippon and Rashef who have uh, created an index of financial deregulation and um, it plots that against the relative wage earned by people in finance as against other occupations, and again, uh, this uh, bottoms out in the 1950s, 1960s. Um, the last piece of financial regulation was the National Banking Act of 1956. Okay, now, what has happened is, uh, as these changes have occurred is that voters have increasingly been stratified by income. So what this graph shows you is the ratio of either the percentage voting Republican in presidential elections um, in, the, uh, in the top quintile of the income distribution to those in the bottom quintile of the income distribution. And this ratio in the 50s and 60s was just um, around one. And except for this odd spike, which probably is more a problem with the survey than anything else. Uh, is there been around two in, the, in, in recent years, so that has gone up quite a bit. Um, if you don't think that income is 
important to voting. Uh, let's, here we're gonna show you a picture for, um, these are campaign, actually these are campaign contributions to Republicans by uh, 140,000 medical doctors uh, and uh, the con contributions data, we know what they're contributing. From uh, another survey, we know average income in about 50 specialties. And uh, although all these people uh, are you know, over $200,000 a year, so they should all be Republicans, on the other hand, they're all uh, you know, they're all educated professionals, so they should all be Democrats. But income is still really biting in what they do, okay? And, you know, if you are a conservative and have to take your kid to the pediatrician, be concerned that that pediatrician is very likely to be a Democrat. But if you have to get cut up yourself, be concerned that the guy that's going to cut you up is very likely to be a Republican. Maybe you'd rather not know. Okay. Uh, so. One of the things that's, that's driving not much redistribution uh, is that uh, uh, the people who vote are generally high income types. So if you're over $150,000 a year, which are the right most bars in these two graphs, uh, particularly in presidential elections, you have very high turnout. And then uh, turnout in the lower groups is depressed for two reasons. One, those people that are citizens don't vote very much, and secondly, that they are disproportionately non-citizens, okay? Um, so um, you have uh, low, low turnout and ineligible adults limit the incentives to redistribute through uh, the electoral process. So you have very simple economic models uh, of redistribution I'm going to tell you that what's kind of important is the ratio of median income to the mean income. So if the median voter has relatively low income to the mean income, there's an incentive to redistribute. Uh, and if you look at the top heavy black line, which is the median voter to the mean family, that has decreased over time. It was pretty stable for a long period of time. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning, shot down in the last two elections. But it's much higher than the curves when you compare uh, the median, fam median citizen, which is a median curve, to the mean family or uh, the median um, family to the mean family. So you know, the incentives to redistribute, if everyone in the adult population voted, including non-citizens, would be very different than if of just the people that do vote. Um, and Campaign contributions, they're polarizing rapidly. They're more polarized than Congress. Um, so uh, the, this shows you the distribution of, uh, of campaign contributions on an ideological scale, so, and it shows you the politicians. So uh, these humps over here on the left are about where Bill and Hillary are and the humps on the right are about where Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan are. You can't see that, but you, know, you got George Soros and Sergey Brin and Larry Page over on the left and David Koch somewhere on the right, but not that far out on the right. And then the, the gray line is small contributors. These are not people that give $3 to an email from Jim Messina, but people like who give $1,000 uh, and reporting contributions, you can see that they're much more polarized than uh, the fat cats who are uh, the heavy black line or Forbes 400 and uh, Fortune 15, uh, 500 CEOs uh, and directors. So uh, campaign contributions are, are, are polarized. Um, and they show really high inequality. So uh, the heavy black line is the Gini coefficient of campaign contributions, and you can see that that's risen over time. I like the gray line, which shows uh, what proportion of campaign contributions are being provided by people that, whose contribution is more than half of median income, because somebody was earning median income, you'd be very surprised if they contributed half of that income. And you can see that, uh, what is it? Yeah, it's, 
Yeah, they're almost all campaign contributions. Okay. Uh, and there's more inequality in campaign contributions and income inequality. Um, the, let me just skip this. And so, uh, and so one reason I'm kind of gloomy about changing, change is the, the extent to which the Democrats um, have become reliant on big donors. So this graph shows you um, whether it's weighted by contribution amounts or not. The, the percentage of contributions from the Forbes 400 uh, that have gone to Republicans. And in the 80s, uh, this was well over 65%, and it's now slightly below 60%. So the fat cats have actually shift, shifted somewhat to the Democrats. And despite all the stuff you know about small donors and Obama, forget about it, the Democrats are very highly reliant on, 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 on big money. So just now let me wrap up. So I'm pessimistic, and I had some forewarning that uh, Professor Stiglitz was actually going to be more optimistic. Uh, and uh, in the aftermath of Iraq and the financial crisis, I have to admit by being surprised that the country actually moved to the right. Uh, what I was not surprised about was, you know, Obama's claim that he could overcome polarization. I th always thought that was a fantasy, and he didn't. And I don't, Hillary Clinton the other day announced that she was going to cha change campaign finance, and I think that's very cheap talk. But it won't happen. And our institutions kind of, uh, I think our institutions kind of doom us to be where we are for a long time. So you probably want to argue with that. So I'll stop. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Sorry about the little technical difficulty. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is picking up a little bit where Professor Rosenthal left off and, if you will, disaggregating the notion of voter opinion and the political process and the types of outcomes that Howard was actually demonstrating within his graphs and trends. So we're going to, a lot of this data is uh, from Jeff Lax and Justin Phillips and combining it with some of my own. So we're going to be looking at an issue of polarizing opinions and asking the question, do income differences impact representation? Oh, and this is the clicker. There we go. So as we know, income inequality, just looking at income inequality in the United States is among the highest in advanced economies. And this is just the Gini coefficient. And you can see that there's a real differences among the states, the southern states, New York, as you might anticipate. It's, even if it's a democratic state, it has a big difference between Manhattan and upstate in its, in its uh, demographics and income. And so the question then is, um, what is income, this income inequality linked to? And usually a lot of the data has focused on the outcome variables, outcomes such as economic opportunity economic opportunity, educational attainment, lower health standards, diminished productivity. The question really is, is this necessarily true? Does unequal income have to lead to unequal outcomes? And really I think what we see is that there's a missing step between income and policy outcomes. And that step is really the politi political representation. And this is what Howard alluded to about regarding the institutions. And so the question is, does income inequality impact political representation? Are elected representatives more responsive, in essence, to the preferences of the rich, right? And if we put this in a political economy terms, in a majoritarian system, do legislators weigh high income voters' preferences more than those of low income voters? Now, just to get a handle on this, we're going to focus on Senate roll call votes, and we're going to identify uh, key issues on the roll call votes, and there'll be 29 total that we'll look at. And we'll estimate state level measures of constituency preferences, and we'll put them into in income quintiles, and we'll focus on the bottom and the top quintiles. And we're going to compare preferences of these different groups to individual Senate votes. Now, measuring 
opinion is always difficult, and here we're going to focus on uh, 51 national opinion polls, and we're going to use a multi-level mod model of individual preferences as a function of a, a series of state demographics. And a lot of this work really has been developed by Jeff Lax and Justin Phillips. So if you just take that and you look at uh, income polarization by state and looking at the different opinions, one thing that you notice is, in fact, that the average opinion of these states over all the issues looked at is actually not as exasperated as that when we looked at the top and bottom quintiles. So what we see here is that this is just looking at the average differences in opinion between the top and the bottom income quintiles across all the issues that we will be looking at. And the note was that the polarization of policy preferences between these income brackets is much less than the overall income disparity. We can see this also manifested in the polarizations by issues. And if you can see here, um, this just looks at the the, what the top, the differences in opinion between the high and the low income brackets over all of these issues. And what you note, and you can't see here, is that the areas that have the biggest differences in, of, of opinion really reside on economic issues. Issues like free trade, uh, capital gains tax, and minimum wage. Okay? And if we take this and we look at all, breaking these down into states, again focusing on the differences of uh, opinion, there's the average, and then breaking it down into issue categor categories, economics, social, and defense. Again, here what you see is that um, the, the, the top, I can't see it, but the top, the top states up there are Mississippi, South Carolina, Alabama, Virginia. Those are the states that actually have some of the highest income disparities. And also from this, you can see that the biggest range of disparities is, again, over the economic issues, not on social issues or defense issues. So the voter preferences, then, again, are most um, polarized in the southern states. And then, again, the preferences between the top and the lowest income quintiles, right, diverge greatly across the issue areas as, com when we comp as a compared to the national average. Okay. One other thing to note, I noted that those states, Mississippi, South Carolina, and so on, had the largest divergence in preferences. And we also can see that they also have some of the largest populations of blacks. Okay? And so the correlation between the percentage black within a state and the averages of difference of opinions between the bottom and the top quintile. Again, here, who are you looking at? Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, South Carolina. Okay? And so the difference in policy opinion between the rich and the poor is highly correlated with the percentage of black, blacks in the state, and the states with the highest difference also have the highest income in, in disparity. So how do representatives vote, given that we have this difference in the preferences across the, the voters? And here, you, could, you can see is this is just given disagreement so the vertical act is, axis is disagreement between low and high income quintiles. And then the percentage of times that a senator votes with the high or the low income quintile. So here is the convergence on the left, on the vertical axis convergence with the high income voters. The horizontal axis is convergence with the low income voters. And what you see is they're basically red is, uh, the red is the Republicans, the, the blue are the Democrats. And what you could see is they're basically splitting along party lines. There's a few exceptions like uh, Caldwell from um, uh, liberal states, uh, who's a Democrat from Wisconsin. And so what we see is that representatives basically vote along party lines, and a few exceptions from liberal states. And it also means that those issues where there are differences between the high and the low income quintiles, where they disagree, these are the, there's going to be little room for policy compromise. Okay. So the question is, are members responsive? And here what you can just see is the first, the first lot, uh, row shows the share of times a group gets its desired vote. And you can see that 53% of the time of the representatives will vote with the lower quintile, and then 58% of the time they'll vote with the 
upper income, there, there's cases where they both agree, so that's, that's why it's not counting to 100%. So yes, they do, they are responsive, senators are responsive to, to voters' concerns, but look at, this, look at the bottom part, in the times when these groups actually disagree, all right, you see that senators will vote only 41% of the time with the lower income brackets, while they'll vote 59% of the time with a top quintile. So yes, they are representative, representative, but when the rich and the poor disagree, the rich will win out more often. And so, and this is going to be over the crucial areas of what we saw of economic policy. Again, go back to the issue areas, minimum wage, capital gains tax, and so on. Okay, so what are the implications? What we find is interesting that state level opinion polarization is actually uncommon. There's not a lot of differences in people's opinions on the state, okay? The biggest differences where they are actually matter a lot. They're on economic issues, okay? And we also see that there is significant differences between the parties. We also find, and this goes back to the institution's statement, that representation is unequal among income groups. Rep uh, preferences of high income groups are stronger predictors of voters than low income groups. And when there's disagreement between the income groups, the top income quintile will prevail. And that's basically the story between the impact of policy preferences, the representation, and the types of policy outcomes that we observe. Um, so, I'm an economist, uh, that means I know very little about politics and uh, I'm going to say a few things about politics and uh, when I say them they will probably be coming out of ignorance rather than knowledge. What I know a little bit more about is uh, uh, data on, uh, on inequality and uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, just uh, present some uh, uh, some facts uh, about inequality, and uh, uh, what I want to uh, highlight is uh, something that uh, uh, has not been uh, discussed to, to a large extent so far, and that is uh, uh, that, uh, you know, yes, we know inequality has been increasing, but there's a question of why it has been increasing, and, uh, and then uh, you know, we've uh, different, different stories for why it has been increasing are uh, presumably have different consequences both for political outcomes and, uh, and policy responses and so on. So I'm, I'm going to sort of uh, try to, to touch a little bit uh, on that. And uh, at some points in this presentation, you will notice that I refer to uh, Piketty, maybe more than I should. That's because I sort of adapted presentation from a discussion of Piketty's book. Uh, so, uh, uh, so this is uh, the graph that uh, probably most of you have seen, uh, or at least parts of this graph. Uh, so uh, uh, the, there's influential work by uh, Piketty and Saez that uh, has documented uh, uh, the, the increasing uh, concentration of incomes uh, and uh, usually the way it's presented is that you sort of focus on top groups and, uh, uh, and show the, the share of, uh, uh, of uh, income uh, going to the top group. So that's, uh, that's the black line uh, and the key observation is what we've seen so far, what we've already seen is that, uh, uh, is that uh, there is a U-shaped pattern over, uh, over the course of the, uh, the century. There was high uh, concentration of incomes in, uh, 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 in, the, in the first part of the century. It dropped very rapidly, actually interestingly, not during Great Depression, but uh, after it, really during World War II, stayed low, and then started <laughs> increasing uh, over time, starting from uh, at some point probably in the 1970s. Um, I added uh, a second line uh, here, which is basically parallel, uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's highlighting something that's uh, also well known, but uh, depending on who is talking, uh, ignored. Uh, so the, the second line is uh, earnings shares as opposed to income. So uh, what is income? Uh, the, that data is coming from uh, tax returns and the definition of income is what you get from your work, but also uh, all forms of uh, capital income, so what you get as the return on your assets. Earnings, uh, uh, that data is coming 
purely from uh, uh, from uh, uh, it's, it's actually coming from from some social security. So it's uh, payroll uh, payroll information. It's uh, uh, it's what people get from uh, from their own work. Uh, there is no capital income unless it's misclassified uh, uh, in uh, in that uh, in that series. And the main point is that uh, it behaves in a very similar way as uh, as the overall income series. So that's uh, uh, so the. The main point is that uh, when you look at uh, changes in inequality over uh, over the last, uh, especially over over the last 30, 40 years, uh, they have been to a large extent driven by. That's not me. Uh, they have have been driven by uh, inequality in earnings, uh, uh, in compensation, rather than uh, than inequality uh, in capital income. That's not to say that there isn't high and increasing inequality in capital incomes, but the sort of the Basic, uh, uh, the basic uh, uh, core force that has been driving inequality is, uh, is earnings. Right. So now, uh, this was top 1%. Uh, so the topic uh, here is polarization. So, uh, uh, so this is as far as I will get into politics. Uh, so you, if you think about uh, polarization, uh, what can it mean? Uh, you can, you know, distribution is a lot of people, and you can look at uh, various places in, uh, uh, in, uh, in, in the income distribution. So uh, what this graph shows is, uh, this and the next graph, uh, are sort of uh, 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 bits of information about uh, where exactly the inequ uh, inequality has been growing and how, how has it been changing. So this is uh, the average earnings, uh, the ratio of average earnings of people in the top 1%. Uh, to people in the next 9% of, uh, of the earnings distribution. So, uh, uh, so this is all people who are sort of at the top of the distribution, they're just uh, or the 10% with, uh, uh, with the highest earnings. And uh, the point here is that uh, uh, that ratio has been moving dramatically. Uh, so, uh, uh, so if you look at people with very, uh, very high earnings, the, their earnings have increased dramatically to people who are you know, upper middle class uh, by any any standard. Um, so that's that's my ignorant uh, reaction to some uh, some of the some of the discussion that uh, uh, that that uh, that uh, that, uh, that we already had. That when I think about uh, inequality, I don't necessarily think about uh, top one percent versus or top quintile versus the bottom quintile. There is much more that has been happening with uh, with inequality than uh, that uh, sort of a simple uh, a simple division of uh, of uh, top uh, to to the bottom. And you know, if you live in New York, you kind of realize that it's a democratic city. It's a very high income city. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, if you if you were just thinking that uh, income determines political preferences, that's uh, you know. That doesn't seem to fit, but perhaps you know, th this type of uh, pattern may actually have something to do with it. Uh, so here we are not talking about uh, 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 we, are, we are not talking about uh, comparing very wealthy to uh, to very poor. We are just talking about comparing wealthy to uh, to somewhat wealthy who are uh, not keeping pace with uh, with the very top of the distribution. Okay, so that's uh, that's the top end. Uh, uh, what this graph shows is uh, uh, the rest of the distribution, and uh, uh, it's actually about polarization in a very, in a different sense, in the sense that uh, uh, probably related sense, but uh, in, in the sense that uh, labor economists use it. Uh, so, uh, 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 so the two lines here are a ratio uh, of uh, median earnings to earnings at the 20th percent percentile. So look at somebody in the middle of the distribution, compare them to the bottom. So that's the top line. And that top line is kind of interesting because uh, uh, the, we are talking about increasing inequality, but that line is not really growing. It's sort of stable and uh, actually some people, there are different ways to construct it. Uh, some people would even argue that it, it may, it's, uh, uh, it's somewhat declining. So if you, if you want to think about you know, what's happening at the bottom of the distribution, look, you compare very poor to the middle, to people in the middle of the distribution, the very poor have, have not necessarily been losing ground to the middle of the distribution. What has been happening, and that's the second line, uh, is a comparison of the 80th percentile to the median. 
and that line is increasing. Uh, so uh, what that means is that people at the middle of the distribution have been losing ground to the top of the distribution. So that's the sort of uh, the polarization that uh, labor economists often, uh, often talk, uh, talk about, and that sort of uh, separation of the upper half of the distribution and the lower half of, uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of the distribution. It's not necessarily about poor getting very poor. It's, uh, it's sort of about big groups kind of moving, uh, moving apart from, uh, from each other. Right, so uh, if you want to think about uh, what's important for these graphs, uh, I will highlight some things on this graph and then uh, I will completely ignore them. But uh, I want just to, uh, to say that there are many different things that have been happening and that matter. Right, so, uh, so what was uh, important in uh, shaping inequality uh, over the course of, uh, of the century? So the, uh, the first thing I highlighted here is uh, World War II. Uh, there was a dramatic decline in uh, income inequality during World War II. And uh, the first time I saw it, I was actually very surprised because uh, without thinking much about it, you would think you know, there was Great Depression in the, 19, uh, in the late 1920s, uh, 1930s. You would think that this is something that should have had uh, impact on inequality, but that's not, when, uh, uh, that's not when things happened. Things happened afterwards, and actually they didn't even happen in the 1930s where, uh, uh, where some of the progressive taxation uh, was introduced. They happened afterwards. They happened uh, during World War II. What happened during World War II? I mean, we know some things, but we don't know exactly what mattered here. Uh, we know that there was a lot of regulation and uh, there was an increase in the progressive taxation. We also know that the economy has changed dramatically. So uh, there was a movement, uh, there was a push toward uh, uh, industri industrialization that, uh, that may have mattered. Right? The second thing I want to highlight is uh, 1970s. So that gets kind of hard and uh, uh, difficult to in interpret. Uh, basically, there's a question of when inequality has started increasing. When uh, there's literature on this, most people think that uh, it started moving in the 1970s. And you can sort of see on this graph in the, in the earnings series, although not necessarily in the, in the income series. Now, that's kind of interesting because uh, 1970s uh, are the period be before uh, sort of big policy uh, changes that, uh, that you may think uh, matter for, uh, for, uh, for inequality have, uh, have ha happened. So it's before uh, big tax reforms of the 1980s, it's before uh, the regulation of uh, financial industry and so on. Right. The third thing I want to, uh, to highlight here is, uh, uh, is the, uh, the oddest part of, uh, of these graphs. Uh, and uh, there is a big, big jump that happens uh, in incomes uh, between 1986 and 1988. Now, what happened between 1986 and 1988, um, most people don't really think about these years as special unless you, you are a tax economist. If you're a tax economist, you know that the biggest tax reform in the, uh, in the last, I guess, 70 years have, has taken place, in, uh, took place in, uh, in 1986. And we know what happened. Uh, with the data, actually there is a data issue here. Uh, uh, we know that uh, a lot of income got shifted from, uh, from being reported on corporate tax returns to, to being reported on individual income tax returns that, uh, that shows up in, uh, in this data. So that's not to say that that's the explanation for, uh, for the graph, but the, that's to say that there are a lot of sort of institutional things and policy related things that matter for, uh, for, how, uh, for, uh, for how these graphs look like. All right, so I highlighted uh, uh, institutional things and uh, uh, I'm going to switch gears because I don't think institutions are sort of the explanation for uh, what's been happening with inequality. I, I, my personal view is that uh, institutions respond to what happened with, with inequality rather than, uh, uh, I mean, they may have some causal effect, but they are sort of not the primary force for uh, what's been happening with inequality. So if you go back to Thomas Piketty's book that probably most of you have heard about, uh, it's kind of schizophrenic book on, uh, on that topic because book is, is, is about uh, long-term trends and highlighting, uh, let's call it general economic laws that uh, Thomas invented uh, uh, as explanations for, uh, for long-term changes. But then when he talks about uh, what's been happening in the last 30, 40 years, 
uh, he actually highlights uh, the role of institutions. He, he thinks that uh, it's the institutions that are uh, very important for what's been happening. That's sort of at odds with much of the economics literature that uh, highlighted different explanations. And uh, if you sort of uh, look at the labor economics literature, the, uh, the, main, the main story that sort of comes out of that is that uh, there has been technological change that, uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that, has, uh, uh, that has changed how the labor market works, what's the return to, uh, to skills in the, uh, in the labor market, and so on. And then on top of this, you can sort of add additional factors. You can think about the role of demographics, the role of uh, changing education that sort of interact with, uh, with changes in technology. And these are sort of uh, things that, uh, that sort of shaped how, uh, how long-term changes in, uh, in inequality, uh, uh, in, uh, in inequality ha have looked like. So uh, sort of when I think about inequality, like my starting point tends to be thinking about technology as the sort of uh, the primary force, and then sort of a lot of other things follow. Uh, all right, so uh, what, what, is it, what, is, what is it, what is it about technology that has changed? Uh, so people talk about uh, something called general purpose technologies. So what are general purpose technologies? I mean, there's technological change that happens, uh, uh, that happen, happens on the time, all the time. There are innovations in particular industries. But once in a while, you have uh, technologies that, uh, uh, that affect a lot of uh, basically the whole economy at the same time. So you can think about electricity, you can think about mass transportation, you can think about IT. These are, uh, these are, uh, these are technological, uh, technological changes that are not limited to, uh, to a specific sector of the economy that sort of change how that, that particular sector changes. These are sort of changes that, uh, uh, that affect the whole economy economy at the same time. And these are sort of complex changes, meaning they probably take uh, a very, very long time to sort of uh, to work the, uh, their way through, uh, through the whole economy. All right. so, uh, uh, so what's special about them? Well, um, uh, okay, so they affect a lot of sectors at the same time. Uh, they uh, may, uh, uh, may favor par particular types of skills. So that's, uh, uh, that's what, uh, 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 what people tend to think about uh, in the context of sort of general labor market. Uh, the uh, technology has, uh, has favored uh, uh, skills that uh, are jobs that are sort of non-routine. Uh, they are disruptive. Uh, because uh, uh, new, techno new technology of that kind is changing how, how the business is done in, uh, in any particular sector. Old capital is not necessarily in the position to take advantage of that. Uh, uh, you, know, uh, you, you may think about sort of IT firms as, as sort of natural examples of uh, firms that benefit from, uh, from, the techno uh, from, from new technology, but uh, uh, other examples that you may think of are sort of companies like Walmart. What's so special about Walmart and uh, how is it related to technology? Well, that's a, that's a company that, uh, that was basically the first one that uh, figured out how to optimize its, uh, its supply chain. That's a technological innovation. That's a technological innovation that was hard to do in the 19th century. It was something that they figured out in, you know, in the 1950s, 60s, and so on. It is linked to, uh, to IT technology. You can also think about finance. I'm not ignoring the role of regulation, but uh, when you, you look at and sort of changes in you know, how a lot of other changes in how, how the, the industry operates, but uh, finance nowadays is very different industry than it was 40 years ago. They do things differently. They use different, uh, different technology, different, uh, uh, different types of uh, uh, financial instruments, different way of uh, valuing assets, uh, trading in a different way. All of those are things that, uh, that were not possible to, be, uh, to, to do in the 1960s or 70s. And so IT technology contributed to, to, to these things. Now, there is one important challenge to, to, to that way of thinking, and that, turns, and that is that, uh, uh, that uh, inequality has actually not changed in the same way uh, everywhere uh, in the world. Uh, so this growth of very top incomes uh, in particular is, uh, well, it's not completely limited, but it's sort of much stronger in, uh, in the US, UK, Canada. It's not as strong in Germany or France or, uh, or uh, uh, sort of in continental Europe. Uh, 
So that's a potential problem to this explanation. It's sort of, uh, it, it may tell you that, uh, okay, maybe there's something about policies that, uh, that different countries uh, implement that's, uh, that's driving inequality. Uh, but even, so I don't find it fully persuasive because even if you look at the US, inequality is not the same everywhere. Inequality tends to be very geographically concentrated. Uh, so I've, I've never looked up this data, but the claim is that uh, if you remove uh, 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 Manhattan, uh, Silicon Valley, uh, Beverly Hills, and Westchester County from the United States. Uh, not that much has happened to, uh, to inequality in, uh, in, the, in the whole country. Um, and so uh, there are sort of particular places where, uh, where people with very high income and high wealth live. Uh, and uh, 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 we can kind of name the reasons why they live there. There's, uh, there, is, uh, there are some returns to, uh, to, uh, to scale or to agglomeration of people who have kind of work in similar industries and live close to each other. So uh, one potential policy, uh, one potential reason why we don't see so much uh, inequality in France or, uh, or, uh, or in Germany or, uh, or in other countries like this is that uh, uh, sort of these very high uh, income jobs basically got exported to other countries. There's financial centers are you know, in London and, uh, and New York. They are, uh, there's no financial center in Paris. There are very rich French uh, financiers, uh, but they don't necessarily live in France. Uh, so I pr I'm probably out of time. Uh, there's another set of things I, uh, uh, I wanted to say, uh, so I'll just mention them very briefly. So, so far, uh, so far, I've been talking about uh, income inequality or income and earnings inequality. There is, uh, 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 there is another aspect of inequality that, uh, uh, that uh, one may be interested in and that's, uh, that has been receiving a lot of uh, attention, and that's inequality in wealth rather than uh, inequality in income. So uh, from the data standpoint, it's actually much more controversial than, uh, uh, than, uh, uh, than the income inequality, and that's primarily because it's much harder to measure. There, is, uh, there isn't a, as good data on wealth as there is on inequality. So I have three lines on this graph. Uh, I have opinions which ones are correct. They show different patterns, but uh, I'm not going to, to go too much into that. Uh, with the, I'm just going to say that there is controversy about what has been happening to, uh, to, uh, to, to wealth inequality. There are sort of methods that show basically very little change in, the, in wealth inequality, and there is sort of a paper that shows a dramatic increase in wealth inequality, and I guess we are still in the process of uh, figuring that out. Uh, what I want to take from this uh, and highlight uh, is that uh, 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 there may be a reason why different, uh, different approaches uh, produce different results, and why it's uh, in general kind of difficult to talk about top 1% of wealth, and also income distribution as kind of a uh, homogeneous group uh, uh, or in a consistent way, and that, that, is, uh, that is that uh, uh, there are reasons to believe that that group has been changing. Uh, if you look at, uh, at the top 1% uh, or whatever, however you define the group, uh, at the top of the wealth distribution now versus 1970s, these are not, well, obviously these are not the same people because people age and die, but these are not the same types of people. Uh, so uh, um, um, I'll show you two, gra two things on that and stop. Uh, so, so this is uh, coming from uh, uh, a paper I wrote with uh, Lena Edland uh, probably six, seven years ago. Uh, so what it shows is, uh, let's call it age-adjusted uh, number of women uh, filing uh, estate tax returns or for whom the estate tax returns are filed. Uh, so basically an estimate of uh, how many uh, how many of the wealthy, in, how, how much of the wealth at the top of the distribution goes to women versus men. So now what's interesting about this graph, so it covers the, the whole century, is that it, uh, it peaks in the 1970s and declines uh, since. So any statistic that you are going to look at uh, about economic outcomes of women would not look like this. Uh, if you look at, uh, say, average earnings of women, number of women at the top 1% of uh, income distribu distribution, earnings distribution, and so on, that, that line would continue to increase. Now this line peaks in the 70s and declines since, and what do we, 
we have a story why, why that's the case. And that's, uh, the story is basically that uh, uh, very, you can come at very high wealth through two different channels. One is you can inherit debt, you can inherit wealth. The other one is that uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can be self-made. Um, you can look at, you know, no matter how you cut the data, self-made wealth is primarily uh, is dominate, dominated by men. Entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs tend to be men and so on. Uh, so uh, so self-made wealth is kind of uh, tilted toward men. Inherited wealth is kind of equally split. So when you see, uh, when you see uh, a decline in this share uh, during the period when you would think women should be doing better, uh, basically the, the conclusion that you can draw is that uh, the importance of inherited wealth has, has declined and the importance of self-made wealth has increased. So another way to see that, and maybe, maybe I should have a graph here, you can look at the, uh, at the Forbes 400 list uh, and let's say, This column. Uh, so that, that column shows uh, uh, the number of people on the, on the Forbes 400 list uh, who um, we classified as uh, as having uh, uh, having uh, uh, having inherited uh, as having so for for whom the source of their wealth is inheritance as opposed to other reasons. And that's based on sort of how Forbes describes these things. So there are obviously imperfections, but the patterns are very strong. So if you look at uh, 1982, when that list started, 36% uh, uh, of people on that list uh, were classified as, uh, as having inherited uh, wealth. If you look at uh, 2003, which is when we stopped, uh, when we wrote that paper, 16% uh, on that list were classified as, uh, as having inherited uh, their wealth. Uh, so the, uh, there, there has been sort of it seems like there has been a dramatic change in the sort of the nature of uh, of, uh, of who uh, who the wealthy people are, and that, that sort of nicely also accords with uh, uh, with what I started with the sort of uh, labor uh, labor versus uh, versus capital income uh, inequality. So what's been happening for the last uh, 30, 40 years is sort of a structural change in the, in the economy that sort of uh, created a lot of opportunities for people to get. Very wealthy, you see it uh, by uh, you see it in the labor market. That's one place. You see it uh, when you look at uh, at very high wealth. This sort of seems to be much more uh, uh, entrepreneurially uh, driven. So uh, you know, when when uh, when you talk about polarization, I guess this is sort of you know, an important thing to to keep in mind that uh, that when you compare sort of 70s to 2000s. Uh, to, to nowadays, uh, we are not not just talking about sort of rich versus uh, poor and rich getting a little uh, get, getting richer relative to, to the rest of the society, but we are also talking about uh, changing nature of who the rich people are. We have global technology, global forces like globalization, affecting all countries, but the outcomes are very markedly different. That the outcomes in the United States are markedly different from uh, those in other countries uh, really suggest that it isn't just technology that is driving it, it's institutions. Institutions even shape, uh, do shape technology, they do shape what are called innovations. But, you know, some of the, some of the uh, uh, people who are making a lot of money are trying to sell us on the idea that they are getting all that money as a result of the contributions they're making to society. This has been the, you know, for, for 200 years, economists and others have tried to understand the great inequalities in our societies. And there have been basically two strands of thought. One strand of thought focuses on exploitation, that some group is taking advantage of another group. And the other one is a theory of social contribution. Uh, one of the predecessors of, of, uh, uh, of mine at, when I was uh, at Oxford, uh, the first holder of the drumming chair was a guy called NASA Senior. And he came up with the idea of justifying how the rich got so much with this idea called abstinence. Uh, the, the idea was that the rich didn't consume and they had to be rewarded for not consuming. And that was the return for capital. And uh, Mill then talked all these theories about marginal productivity theory. 
and a social contribution. I think that in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis, there should be no, you know, real, this is no longer a controversy, although you still hear from a number of economists. Uh, it is mostly exploitation. And one way of, of um, uh, thinking about that, a couple ways of thinking about that are, uh, you ask uh, in that numbers and that, you know, top 1% of earnings are not people who are working in the way that most of us think work used to be, you know, wearing a blue collar shirt or something like that uh, in a mine. These are basically people like CEOs, bankers, who are basically exploiting others to take money for themselves. So they're not part, of, they're called earnings, but what you label earnings and not is very fungible. And you can reclassify some of earnings as capital gains when you're in the tax law, you can, if you're clever enough. So that these numbers, you, you have to understand, are, are, are a little bit soft. And particularly the numbers at the top are not earnings as we understand it. It's not skilled bias technical change that's leading somebody to be you know, the managers, take the CEOs of the companies, who are on average now being paid 300 times that of their workers. It used to be 30. Was there any change in technology that re increased their productivity relative to ordinary workers by tenfold? There's absolutely no evidence. Is there any evidence that American guys are 10 times more productive relative to managers in other countries. Again, none. So I don't think you can explain what is going on in terms of, of, of technology, that it is that these people are really productive. Another way of seeing it is a point that Paul Volcker made very forcefully, and you could get it out of econometric studies. There is no financial innovation in the United States that it, has any relationship to economic growth. He went on to say, except for the ATM machine. But he was wrong because the ATM was a British innovation, not an American innovation. So you can't justify inequality in America on basis of any innovation in the financial sector. So these guys have been really, really good at exploitation. Predatory lending, abusive credit card practices, anti-competitive practices in, in the payments mechanism, market manipulation, LIBOR, and they've been very successful. So the, the more general view I want to point uh, to, to bring up is, is one where it's not just the policies which affect the redistribution of income, taxes that have been talked about, the progressive taxes, estate taxes, even more fundamental is the fact that the rules of the game the legend, affect the distribution of income before taxes and transfer, what we call pre-distribution. It affects the degree of monopoly power. It affects the, the ability to engage in different kinds of exploitation. One way to see that, I think, very, I think somewhat convincingly, is that if you look at average productivity of, of a wide swath of workers, very large grouping, basically every bottom 99%, but you know, di different classifications. Their productivity has doubled since 1970. And their wages have stagnated, adjusted for inflation. So a huge wa wedge has gone up between the margin of productivity and the average productivity. Now all the models that standard economists use, there's not typically a very strong relationship between the average and marginal productivity, the Cobb-Douglas production function, whichever, uh, they're actually proportional. But in other models, you have to work very hard to get that kind of gap. And it's very hard to see how that kind of gap suddenly arose that there are changes in technology. There was a literature that has since been pretty well discredited, even by the people who put it forward, a factor by technical change, a skill by technical change. that that the reason that there's a pulling apart is that some people have skills and others don't. And there may be some truth in that, but since 2000, even the skilled workers have seen their wages stagnate. 
Now, making the analysis from the point of view of the system, you know, how the economic system works, more difficult, or, or you might say more, more complicated, uh, are some of the results that have come out of uh, Piketty, but a lot of other people, um, talking about the increase in the wealth income ratio. And in all the models that economists typically use, we have output as a function of capital and labor, if you have an increase in wealth and you interpret wealth as capital, an increase in wealth relative to income is equivalent to an increase in wealth relative to labor. And the most uh, basic law of economics is the law of diminishing returns. And I'll come back if I, I have a chance to talk about some caveats on that, but basic law of diminishing returns. If the capital labor ratio goes up, there are two basic propositions. The return to capital ought to go down, diminishing returns, and yet that doesn't seem to be happening very strongly. And the other one is that the capital labor ratio goes up, the wage ought to go up. And what is true is even if you disaggregate into different kinds of labor, there's a very general theorem. Yes, some kinds of labor might have their wage go down if they're substitute for capital. So you have robots that might be substitute for unskilled labor. But other kinds of capital have to have their wage go up. You can, there's a general theorem here in, a, in the context of a uh, constant returns to scale technology. The theorem is that average wages have to go up. And that's what's not happening. So you have to say something's peculiar going on. How do you reconcile, say, this data of Piketty with what has been going on? It's, it, it, it's, it's a paradox, very different from the stylized facts that economists used to use, uh, some of you may know, Ke Nikki Keller in the mid-50s uh, talked about. Well, I think there's one easy way to reconcile what is going on with uh, the new stylized facts. And that is uh, the following. Wealth and capital are markedly different. And there's a wealth of data now showing that wealth and capital are markedly different. Uh, why are they different? Well, uh, the basic idea is rents. And the obvious example of rents are New York, anybody, I, I, it's not New York, it's land. And in, in New York, you think about land, real estate, and that a very large fraction of the increase in wealth has to do with increase in the value of land, land rents. Why is that important? Well, if the value of land in the Riviera or in Southampton, or even in a couple buildings down there go up, it doesn't mean the country's wealthier in any fundamental sense. As I say, the, 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 the amount of land on the Riviera has not changed in the last 100 years, basically. But the value of the land has changed. It's actually worse than that. Because if you have life cycle savers, people are saving, and they have a choice of either putting their savings into productive assets, like capital goods that actually increase the productivity of the economy or into land speculation. There's going to be a diversion. If your land prices are going up, it's going to go into land. And therefore, there'll be much less productive investment in society, and countries are actually poor. Now, if you look at that, take that, that idea to the data, what, what you see is that you can explain, say, in the United States, only about half of wealth of the, of the change in the wealth income ratio. If you look at savings from national income accounts, the national income accounts, when they do savings, they have the kind of savings that, that economists always had in mind. You know, you, you, you had a farm, you got your seed, and then you didn't, you didn't consume all the seed and you replanted it. In the more general cases, you have income, and you take some of the goods that you have, and you don't consume them, you reinvest. That could only explain about half of what's going on in wealth. And the other part has to do with capital, uh, with an, uh, all sorts of rents, or an increase in the value of rent-generating activity. Well, there are three kinds of rents 
that are, are at least come to mind. The first are land rents. So, so the value of land goes up, uh, the value of rents go up, the value, you know, the value of land goes up, you're wealthier, but you're not wealthier in a fundamental sense. Um, the second is exploitation rents. If market power has increased, and market power can increase either because we have more monopolies or because we weaken unions, and so the market power of corporations relative to capital, relative to labor has changed. We've weakened unions, we've done, globalization could actually weaken the bargaining power of workers as well. So what we do is we open up the possibility for more exploitation and what I call exploitation rents. Corporate governance rents, there are a whole set of ranks in, 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 our, in our society. Um, there are exploitation ranks against the public sector. Take the banks again. If the banks persuade Congress to pass a law that allows them, even in a democratic uh, administration, which was opposed by some members of the Clinton administration, and didn't go through until after I left the administration, I want to point out. Uh, so I did uh, re uh, oppose both of those uh, very strongly. And, and uh, so, but you, you, you do that. What, what happens? They can undertake more risk. What happens when there's more risk? The value of the banks go up because the value of the expected value of the bailout payments from the government, from the people, go up. So there's a transfer of wealth from ordinary citizens to the banks. When you have that transfer of wealth, has the wealth of the country gone up? No. But the wealth shows up on the balance sheet of the banks, the negative wealth on our balance sheet, on the taxpayers, doesn't show up. If we give a farm subsidy of even $15 billion a year to the farmers, we're poor because it's taking money out of our pocket. But that subsidy gets capitalized in land values. 15 billion at a 1% discount rate is $1.5 trillion. That's a lot of money. That's 10% of the value of our national income. So one little change, $15 billion, a couple congressmen can put that through, changes the wealth of our country and changes the, you know, and, and so we, you, numbers go up. On the, on the top if you happen to own land. So um, what, I, what, I, what I want to uh, suggest is that, that it is institutions mediated a lot through the political process that have given rise to the growth in inequality uh, in the United States, in other countries as well, but especially in the United States. The unfortunate thing is a lot of other countries try to imitate the United States, and if I were one of the wealthier countries, you know, a CEO in, in, in France, I would be saying, look at America, look how well the CEOs are doing, let's try that model. If I were a French worker, I would not be so enthusiastic about modeling that, and if I were a French politician, uh, I would also uh, resist. But if I were a French CEO, I would say, oh, if you don't do that, I'll go run off to America and, you know, uh, I'll suddenly go from being 30 times more productive than my workers to 300 uh, by crossing the Atlantic. Somehow I'll learn how to be more productive on that, uh, uh, flying on that airplane that quickly. Well, there are aspects of technology that may account for the increase in rents. I don't want to deny the possibility. So for instance, network externalities ne uh, increase and network externalities enable one to exploit more uh, uh, to, to get more monopoly power, but mostly this has to do with the enforcement of antitrust laws. So Microsoft took its position because it didn't make it from being uh, a better product. It invented a way of exploiting, you know, a brilliant idea, bundle, bundle the, the, the browser with, with your operating system that dominates all PCs, a zero price is very hard to compete against. And then they, didn't, they were worried that a zero price was not, cheated, uh, was not low enough uh, in the competition because their product was inferior. What did they do? They had FUD. I don't know if you know what that was. Is they, you, you turn on your computer and they say, danger, danger. If you, had, if you had Netscape, they said, danger, danger. Problem of interoperability. No problem of interoperability. 
They just made it there to, to destroy competition. And who is at the number one of the Forbes 400 list? Well, I won't name him, but who's number two? A monopolist too. So is it, was it because of innovation? Well, there's a little bit of innovation. Was it because of, 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 I think, innovation, but innovation about how to exploit market power? And, and that give, moves you up on, on the, but uh, doesn't have a social contribution. Just as a little bit of an aside, I can't help when you say you know, inheritance is they're less important now. I, that they may or may not be. Uh, but I just want to mention a little factoid. The uh, four, uh, uh, eight people, the six people who inherited the Walmart fortune and the two people who inherited the Koch fortune have as much wealth as the bottom 44% of America. That's a high degree of polarization in our society. And they may have increased their wealth by something they did, but a lot of what they did, the way they did it, was through market power and political influence. So uh, that, that brings me to, to I think, uh, a little bit, I'll, I'll uh, uh, digress into uh, the po politics of where we are today in American politics, uh, if, I, if I may. Uh, I think I, I want to be a little bit more optimistic, as you said I would be, a little bit more optimistic about what, uh, uh, and optimism is based on a couple of facts. Uh, one of the reasons of optimism is that we now recognize uh, the magnitude of our economic and political inequality. Uh, and we recognize that there's a link between economic and political inequality, partly caused by uh, contributions. Um, uh, I, I do agree changing it is not going to be easy, but, but we do recognize it. And, and when I've go, uh, gone around the country talking about, say, my, uh, my previous book, uh, uh, The Price of Inequality, um, one of the topics that gets raised more, uh, you know, almost universally is Citizens United, which has become the symbol of political inequality. It's not each, even the worst example of a Supreme Court decision, but it is one that's become symbolic in America for political inequality and the link between economic and political inequality. Um, the second uh, reason for a little bit of optimism is that uh, we've had political battles that we've won over, uh, uh, over these issues. And so you might say the progressive side, the people who care about inequality, have been able to win some battles. And, and ex you know, it, there's always a trade-off between doing the quantitative data where you have, uh, and trying to identify what are really the important. It's very hard qualitatively to do it. But for instance, we had a very big battle over who would be the next chairman of the Federal Reserve. Would it be somebody who would at least raise the questions of inequality, would be sensitive to it, even if the policy didn't change that much, or was somebody whose objective in life had been to increase inequality and who actually was a responsible uh, advocate for the reduction of the capital gains tax, even ex post, you know, said that not only should you lower a capital gains tax, but even on investments that have already been made, an argument for which there could be no incentive basis. It was just basically an inequality increasing uh, policy. Um, and we won that battle. And that was a very fierce battle, but, but the outcome, we, we all know who, uh, that battle. Uh, the battle on trade policy is going on right now. Uh, it looks like we lost uh, a skirmish uh, yesterday, but, but uh, it is a log battle. And my reading in Congress is, is that the intensity, it, it is very intense. And, and I think that the outcome will be markedly different from what it, from because of this new awareness uh, of, of inequality. So I, 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 I think that there is a, a, a very uh, uh, big change in discourse. So let me try in the last few minutes to describe where, where at least uh, a fraction, a part of the, of the Democratic Party is now uh, 
thinking, and hopefully it will have some influence on, on, on beyond the party and, and the political process. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there is a, a coming together on, on some of these basic ideas, uh, and there will be a big uh, event, a set of events uh, uh, next month in, in Washington around these. Uh, the basic I idea really follows from what, what I've already said, that, that inequality, in, to the extent that it's already reached in the United States, is, uh, is a serious problem, and I think most Americans now recognize that. It's not only inequality in income, inequality of wealth is even b higher, but one of the things that's particularly concerned is inequality of opportunity. And the, the research that's been done has shown very high correlation between inequality of income, inequality of outcomes, inequality of opportunity. And inequality of opportunity is particularly, I, I'd say, politically salient because it's part of what we think of as a defining characteristic of the United States. The reality is that we have lower levels of equality of opportunity than almost any of the other advanced countries. And the, that, that is to say, the life chances of young Americans are more correlated with the, with the income and education of his parents than in other advanced countries. That's a very telling message. And we, ha you know, we, ha we know a lot about why that is, but it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, telling aspect of inequality. Um, part of it has to do with our education system, local education. Part of it has to do with the fact that we are not, you know, you talked about the polarization. There's another way of polarization. We are becoming a society that is more economically segregated. That people are living in, there's some more interesting work by, by uh, Reardon and Bischoff on, on uh, the extent to which our, our spatially we're becoming more segregated. And, and since schools are local, that means educational opportunity is becoming uh, more polarized. Uh, so, uh, the, with awareness of the magnitude of the level of inequality, the sources of inequality that I get, the view, I think, is increasingly uh, that an economic agenda that's going to address it has to go beyond tweaking the system. That it can't just be uh, an improvement in minimum wage, there'll be everybody, that's necessary but not sufficient. Uh, improving education, more progressive taxation, getting rid of carried interest, uh, taxing uh, capital gains at the same rate as ordinary income, getting rid of the step up of basis and on, on uh, uh, step up basis uh, uh, on inherited uh, wealth. All those are, are necessary, but those are minimalist agenda. And the much more aggressive agenda is that we have to change the rules of the game. We have to change the rules by you know by which our economy functions. It's much deeper than that. And so there, there's a program being developed that, that goes towards um, corporate governance, uh, you know, rules about the taxes uh, on, on uh, CEO pay relative to um, uh, the pay of average. Now, just to give you one example of how the rules and regulations, tax structures, uh, make, make a difference. Uh, in 1993, there was a wide recognition that CEO pay had gotten out of hand. And uh, uh, there was a proposal, was pa uh, adopted by the administration, to tax CEO pay that was in excess of a million dollars or to make it not fully tax deductible. You know, so that would try to dampen down the extremes. But then, one member of our, of the National Economic Council, uh, the chairman, as it were, uh, whose income the previous year had been $25 million, thought it was maybe not such a good idea to pass this uh, without having another little clause. So, the clause that was put out except for performance pay. Of course, what that meant was that everybody changed the name of their pay to performance pay, unrelated to any real performance. You know, I've been writing for a long time the fact that stock market prices were not a good measure of performing. Stock prices go up if the Fed call, cuts the interest rate, that if there's a stock market bubble, all kinds of things like that. Why should the CEO get a, a pay increase because 
Greenspan cuts the interest rate and his stock price goes up. It was a form of theft. That was what was going on. Or why should an airline executive get a higher pay because the stock price of an airline, uh, airline goes up because the price of oil goes down. He didn't cause the price of oil to go down. Why should his pay go up? It was a form of theft. And we, we had developed theories of what would be a good incentive pay, but the CEOs were not interested in developing good incentive pays. They were interested in getting money in ways that the shareholders did not know and understand. We then had a fight about re disclosing how much the CEO pay was, the share op the value of the share, the dilution, the shareholders. And the same people who had put this provision in said, no, no, that would just confuse people. And we almost got a regulation that said you had to make a disclosure, but we lost. So a little disclosure then gave them the opportunity to steal more money. So the, I know steal is a strong word, but I don't know uh, what a better word is. So that's, that's um, uh, one part of the agenda. One part of the agenda is to try to rewrite the rules of the game to make our economic system work better and more fairly. And the other part of the, of the economic agenda is one of the consequences of what is going on is that middle America is having a very hard time. As the banks have tried to exploit people, harder to pay for education, harder to get other basic necessities, harder, you know, buying a home is more difficult. And we're in a situation now in America where our basic mortgage system is run by the government in a private enterprise system because the banking system says we're not interested in doing it in any way where there's a system of accountability. So what we're doing is proposing a set, a whole agenda that will address a, 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 an agenda that will basically enable Americans to live uh, better, at least meet some fraction of the aspirations that we used to be, used to be, part of what was thought of as a middle class life, but no longer is part of a middle class life. So I'm hopeful that, that this kind of a framing of the issue, this kind of understanding of the issue, will change the politics in America. And um, on two, Monday, uh, this new book comes out, uh, <laughs> trying to uh, 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 explain why things have gone so bad. It's called The Great Divide, uh, Unequal Societies and What We Can Do About Them. Okay. So we have <coughs> we have time for a few questions. Uh, so if you would uh, uh, come to the microphone and uh, briefly identify yourself and ask the question. While we're waiting for the first question, let me ask uh, a question myself. Uh, Joe, you had a very uh, provocative and, of course, perceptive uh, way of looking at things. The one thing you were arguing was that there is sort of more capital, so the capital to labor ratio has increased dramatically. Would be if, we, if wealth was capital. But I, I, I should but have said, if you, look at the NB, if you look at the data from OECD, hmm. in many countries, the actual capital labor ratio outside of real estate outside of housing has actually gone down. Go down, yeah. And once you right. realize that, you understand what, one of the reasons why, why things have not gone so well. Right, right, right. And I was going to point out that on the global level also with China and India being much more in the place with so many people, obviously the amount of labor in the global economy has in some sense, the integrated global economy has gone up as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that was your question. Oh, okay. <laughs> Come, come, come to the microphone. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually done. So it's um, Patrick Puhani from the University of Hanover in Germany, and uh, I wanted to ask uh, Joe Stiglitz the question on why you didn't talk about um, you know, India and China. They brought a lot of labor effectively into the global economy, and uh, in northern Germany where I work, you can see it. The containers are running all the time past the railway stations from Hamburg port in both directions. So um, 
And the other question relates to skill bias te technological change that labor economists debated a lot. Controversially also, some people believe that institutions are, uh, that globalization is important, but I think a majority is talking about, you mentioned it, uh, skill bias technological change. Um, given that you asked part of my question already, the last thing I, I'm uh, thinking about myself is how much uh, could we gain in terms of reducing inequality uh, in our countries, United States or, or Western Europe, by taxing the 1% richest people. So they're not even 1% of the population are CEOs. I don't know how many are, probably not even a per mil. I don't know whether the word exists. So um, you know, how could we help the people in the South Bronx by taking away some money from the CEOs? Is that actually enough money to help these uh, large masses of the poor, as it says in this sort of statute of liberty, I don't have the exact quote, that flock into um, the industrialized countries seeking better lives. There's so many people. Uh, if you distribute uh, a couple of billions to them, is it enough to make their lives better? Go ahead, answer a question, and oh. as you think of questions, come to the microphone okay. to get ready. Yeah, well, first, and the point I, I, the first point I want to make uh, it was, uh, and it was the same, but the white check made, was globalization is a global process. And the way it's played out differently in different countries is clearly shaped by the institutionals of the different countries. So, yes, globalization is one of the, is an important force. But when you talk about why is American inequality worse, it has to do some, to some extent with our, with our own uh, institutions. The second point, I guess I make with globalization is that, um, and in a way it's, it's going back, the same thing. Globalization was supposed to make us a wealthier country. And the nature of a wealthier country, it ought to be, when I say wealthier, most citizens should be able to be better off. And yet median income in the United States today is lower than it was 25 years ago. So again, you have to link it with the institutions that Yes, if it were the case that, that globalization was actually improving our standard of living, if we had a politics that could take those gains and redistribute them, then it would be one in which most of us would be gaining. But right now, the, the, what has been happening as a result is that most, most of our citizens are, are actually uh, worse off. The, the, um, the good news about all the inequality that has happened, there aren't many good aspects of it, but the good news is that there's so much money at the top that if you taxed it a little bit, it could actually make a difference. And not just the CEOs, but the, the numbers of the 20% of the income that goes to the top 1%, you take, an, you know, you take out, pay, have, have them pay an extra 10% of their income as taxes, that's 2% of GDP, and that's a big deal in a world in which uh, uh, federal revenue is about 18% of GDP. That's a significant increase in, in revenue. There's something else going on that, in our economy that, that has not gotten, I think, as much attention as it should. The model of the financial sector that has been sold for a very long time is the financial sector takes money from the household sector and, you know, sort of like the seed model. It takes the, People aren't consuming, it takes for, from the savers and it puts it to the investors and the net flow is going from the household to the corporation so they can use the money more efficiently. In fact, America's financial sector has focused in the last 10, 15 years on taking money out of the corporation. And so actually the, the flow of money is going the other way. There's not money going into productive investment, it's going out. So in a way, it's the way our financial sector is operating. If you can change that, and you say, you know, one of the common, one, one, of, one of my common caricatures of a CEO in America, he says, you know, the reason I, you have to pay me so high is because it's really painful to, pay, to, to fire all those workers. And the reason I have to fire all those workers is that because my pay is so high, we have no money. And the only thing we can do is, is fire workers and not do investment that would increase the productivity of workers so that they would be productive. 
So that's sort of the mentality, the vicious circle that our CEOs have gotten us in that, that basically what's going on is money is going out of the corporation, going to the high CEO pay, and not enough is really going into more productive investment. Final point on skill bias. Uh, I think the, there are two aspects of that. First of all, as I mentioned, what's happened since 2000, ha three points, uh, ha has really undermined that skill bias is what's driving it. That even people at the top are seeing their wages stagnate or go down. So something else is going on. It may be partly the trade thing that you're talking about. There are a lot of other skilled people in the world that are being integrated and that's driving even the wages of skill down and that brings us down to the other issues. The second one is the point I made, even with skill bias, it's the average wage ought to be moving in a particular way. We don't see that. The third point is that the bias of technical change is endogenous. And that if we had a different set of rules, I mean, I'll give you an example, if we priced carbon, we'd have an incentive to have innovation that was more carbon saving. It makes very little, in you know, how can you explain an economic system where we have a high level of unskilled unemployment and yet we are devoting lots of resources to inventing machines that make more unskilled people unemployed? You know, like checkout clerk. The answer is, if you have a Fed that has, interest, that has an interest rate close to zero, it's lower the cost of capital more than it's lower the cost of labor, even though wages are going down. So the government, through monetary policy, is encouraging a jobless recovery and increasing the unemployment. And a lot of evidence. You look at the since inflation targeting got introduced, average unemployment is higher. That drives down wages. That uh, and and that that is part of the structure of of changing the distribution of income within our society. All right. Uh, my name is Joe Betterings. I'm an MBA student here at CBS. Um, my question is actually a follow-up question on the globalization. Um, do you think that TTIP agreement, which is currently negotiated with Europe, will have an impact on e inequality? And more specifically, do you think Europe will export more of its inequality to the US afterwards? Any, any participants so, want to take that up? I mean, so if you look at the composition of that trade, it's, it's not it's actually just re reducing a set of transactions. And so you already have those types of trade flows and take going on. Moreover, what it is is in allowing investment, opening up into areas that had not been there previously. So in some ways, you're not, it's not trade diverting, which is what you would be worried about. Uh, and so it's just actually reducing a lot of the, the, the transaction costs. That's very different than the Pacific trade uh, agreement. That's that's being under negotiation. So I think there, in that case, we're not going to be exporting a lot of inequality. We will be, it is inefficient, it will be reducing uh, transaction costs. But the, but again, I think the real issue is many bilaterals don't make a huge multilateral. And so I, I think that's going to be limiting some of the gains that we, that we would anticipate come from globalization, come from freer trade, come and so on. And so I think just in the structure that those agreements naturally, that they, there's going to be gains, but it's going to be limited. Can, can I give you, uh, sorry, a different, I, I mean, I, I think mo to a large extent these new trade agreements are not about trade in the usual sense because tariffs are already pretty yeah, low. that's correct. And they're really about the regulatory structures. Mm -hmm. And they're really intended uh, to embody in legislation what you couldn't get through American Congress and American courts. Uh, the worst aspect of it, uh, and, and this is both on the transatlantic and transpacific, uh, is something called uh, regulatory takings. That when you pass a regulation, it can lower the expected profits you're going to get. You know, examples like a, a toxic waste dump in the middle of a Mexican city, it passes a law that says, you can't have toxic waste dumps in the middle of the city, and they say, you have to compensate me for not dumping toxic waste. Or the example that is going on now in Uruguay, and uh, uh, Uruguay passed strong legislation to comparable to the United States that 
uh, saying uh, cigarettes are dangerous products and you have to advertise that. You have to label it on the package. In Australia, they label it very graphically. And uh, Philip Morris says that that's a violation of the right to kill people. That's a fundamental human right that all corporations have. Uh, I've labeled this the second, the, the America's new opium war. Uh, as you know, the, one of the first trade opening measures was in the 19th century where Western powers went to China and said, uh, you have to keep your market open to uh, us to sell our opium, which they had figured out wasn't so good. And, but it was a very important uh, commodity for rectifying a trade imbalance, uh, the, the 19th century trade imbalance. And, um, and so the United States USDR is now arguing for this new opium war, not opium, but cigarettes, so that we have the right to unfettered uh, killing of people through cigarettes uh, and, and uh, uh, harming their health. Now, on inequality, that's bad because smokers tend to be poor you have to spend more money dealing with the consequences, the health consequences, and that's less money left over for development and for distribution. So in my, the, that, that this overall trade agreement is bad for inequality. Now, the, the um, uh, and making it even worse, the judicial processes associated with these trade agreements uh, for dispute resolution on, on investment, uh, I think our, our, our embarrassment in a, in a 21st century, you know, that they, they're a step backward. And let me, you know, for a European, put it, uh, if, if there's, any, they, the, these agreements, their investment provisions are being sold as if they're stronger property right protections. If there was anything wrong with the property right protections in Europe, they ought to fix it. But their protections, they believe, are as strong as Americans, and they're going to fix it. They shouldn't fix it just for foreign firms. They should fix it for all firms. American courts have said regulatory takings cannot be compensated. So what they're trying to do is do an end run around our political process to get this provision of regulatory takings into a trade agreement. And that's why this really picks up with the polarization. This would never get through if this were a real democratic process. So, uh, yeah, I, that, is, that is true. So you're going to have, as you saw, one of the biggest contentious issues was be, uh, between the, the income classes was trade, right? And so clearly that, that is going to be manifested in the how, who gets represented and how they get represented. However, I think I'm going to argue that, it, that trades and these trade agreements are and run around the political process, even if the political process produces biased outcomes. Uh, they have fast track authority that has to go through. The Congress does have to vote on it. These are, again, they could be skewed representations, but it's not an end run around our political process. So I, I'm going to I'm going to take exception to that to the extent that it'll have a unequal impact on the economy, because it, that that could be true simply because low skilled wages again are going to have be going to be um, under more duress. But that's a different type of statement than is it just is it just regulatory arbitrage? Yeah, let me give you another example where I, I, I so we, we had a big debate in the country about the balance between generic medicines and big pharma. Okay. okay. And as a result of that, you have to balance the incentives for innovation and ability to get drugs at exp at affordable prices. And you got a compromise. You had a big debate over this issue when we got the Hatch Waxman Act. And it was a resolution, you know, it was a political compromise. Now, inside this trade agreement, you're putting a fundamental change in that political compromise. Yes, it's going to be debated, but it's debated with a thousand other things, and there's not going to be a focused debate on should we rethink the Hatch-Waxman Act. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, you, you could have that debate. I'm pretty sure if we had that debate, the generic, we would come back to something like the Hatch-Waxman. But if we do it through a tra trade agreement, we're not going to get that thorough debate. And what we're going to get is something that is going to be what the big pharma wants. And I want these issues to be debated yeah. one by one so that we can, you know, these are important issues. 
if you can't get access to affordable medicines, people are going to suffer. So the, the issue linkage is an issue. We've tried to link trade and environment, trade and labor, and now we're doing the, the types of regulatory structure issues that, that you're talking about. So that, that is true in the way in which it's, it's, it is going through. We do have omnibus trade, uh, omnibus bills that do a lot of this types and pass contentious issue. And anyway, but that again is an institutional argument as opposed to, yes, you're right, reflection of one issue, issue at a time and what would be the median voter within that context. So, so I, think, I think what this is really saying is, yes, there, there is going to be a distributional impact. It's going to go into the regulations, not necessarily a reduction on the tariff itself. Uh, it will help reduce some of the non-tariff barriers that are difficult for people to manage and, and so forth, but we shouldn't uh, think that trade isn't going to lead to inequality. You, you know, you might also want to look at just what are the differences between proprietary non-generic drugs across countries and ask why they're higher in the U.S. All right, Wojciech, well, you have a point you uh, wanted to make? It wouldn't be on this oh. subject. <laughs> All right, so we'll go to the next question. Uh, hi, Justin. Ooh, go on. Um, from uh, doing an MPA at SEPA. Um, Come closer to the microphone. Uh, doing an MPA at SEPA. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate more on institutions, which institutions, uh, which ones you would prioritize, and what really we should be examining in those institutions. This is causing uh, what we've been talking about today. And I'd, I'd address that to the whole panel. So there's the institutions where the United States were the first past the post, so that it's a majority that gets within, um, it wins. And that's, on, that's different than, say, a list system, where you have in Europe. So that's you say it's just the electoral system. Right, so that, no, no, that's just one part. So what you have then is you can have a, um, who gets elected could be much m different more polarizing than, say, the median voter within it. Then what you have is the, within those institutions, you have the aggregation of them into a vote process, and that could be influenced not only by constituent interests, but also campaign contributions, money and votes. And so the question is, and this is what we were looking at, do you actually reflect all of the people the same, one man, one vote, or do you weigh more heavily those who have the capacity to give or different types of preferences such like as higher incomes. Also, when we aggregate this out into regulatory implementation, there again, you see the role of money, you see the role of corporations, and how the rules are both implemented and enforced. Yeah, I mean, the, I, every aspect of the regulatory structure, you know, you, the fact that how easy it is to unionize mm -hmm. affects whether you have union counterforce. Uh, corporate governance, some state countries like uh, Australia have a law about say and pay that, that say you, the shareholders have to vote on the pay. We, do, we just in, instituted a, a non-mandatory provision along, the, uh, along those lines. I just want to highlight a little bit, even the regulatory framework, and in the trade agreement we're trying to change Europe's regulatory framework. Mm -hmm. One aspect of the regulatory framework that we have that sounds good but actually is works out very badly is you have this notice and comment. You have a comment and then you, it, if you don't respond to the comment, you could be overturned by the court. Well, what that is is an invitation for, the lo for, for the, those with big lobbyists write in lots and lots of comments. And then they make sure that the regulatory the agency is underfunded so they can't answer the comments. And so you, you have a structure that makes it very difficult to get regulations through. Dodd-Frank was passed in 2010. We had regulations, for instance, even a little regulation on transparency on corporate pay and transparency on uh, the, um, uh, when mining companies give money to developing countries Congo. for buying their thing. You know, Congo, yeah. basic transparency provisions can't get the regulation through five years later. But, you know, a lot of that is what Dodd-Frank looked like it has to do with whether you needed 51 votes or 60 votes in the Senate. Dodd-Frank is, what, uh, 5,000 pages long. A lot of the things that haven't been implemented yet could have been legislated rather than as some compromise left to regulators who are easily influenced by what you would call the exploiters 
So um, the the fact that the U.S. has, you know, it's not that you as a member of the administration could have written a financial regulation law after the crisis, <laughs> and it could have been submitted to the a parliament as a, as a matter of vote of confidence that they could not amend it and deal with it. So the fact that we have a Congress that's pretty powerful relative to the executive in this country, and we have this bicameral system, and so you have to pass two houses, and one has a filibuster, is, uh, that interacts with political polarization in a way that has a big influence on what our regulatory structure looks like. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, next question. Hi, I'm Sonia, an MPA student, and I, we've talked about this is a huge problem, and finally people are recognizing that this is an issue, and my question is, what can we do in the future? So what are realistic policy initiatives that we think could pass through Congress or public response necessary to create change. All right, well, some of it was already suggested, but if people have additional um, ideas. Um, well, I'm a pessimist, so I shouldn't have to answer this question. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, Well, you know, in general, if you're, I think the thing is, um, you know, Joe was talking about the public is aware of these things. You make the public very aware of it. So if somehow the public gets to feel that carried interest is just horrendously unequal and has to go, Congress will make it go. But in the absence of it being salient to the public, um, these guys down that way will, um, you know, uh, we'll make sure that it doesn't go. So, um, you know, the optimist says, you know, you're, you're young, get out there and organize and make, make Congress respond. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't seem to have happened very much. I mean, so I think there is agreement that could go through on the minimum wage. I think that's actually going to uh, happen. And even if it's just at the federal level, you're seeing states taking a much aggr much more aggressive area and raising it, and other localities, especially in um, very high income areas. So that's one thing that I think will help, but it's only gonna help at the very bottom, right? And the second thing is education which I think is, I mean, we would all agree, this is the, that's the element that allows for mobility, access to high quality education. It's not just the, the universities, it's the, the K through 12th problem. And that is a local problem, that is a huge problem, and that's something that is going to have to be addressed for us to deal with this. And, it's not always just money, throwing money that, that fixes it. So that's, a, that's one of the big issues that we have to do. Although we have seen people taking uh, attempts to get that in line. And then the other issues that I think could happen uh, are issues around disclosure, are issue for the campaign finance. I could see that, that taking place. Uh, issues around um, the lobbying disclosure as well. I think we could get movement on citizens. I think that would be very important. And not only lobbying for members, but also lobbying uh, the, the regulators, and not just what they, what they con who they contact, but also disclosing what's said, who comes, what was the action subsequent. Disclosure will help. And even if we can't get the actual rules change, telling people what is going on is important. So that's, that's a, not qu I'm, I'm optimistic, but cautiously so. I guess one other thing I, I can say, some of the activity uh, uh, it will ha happen at the city and state level. And I think we've seen that in minimum wage as ways. And, and for instance, in the corporate governance reforms, uh, uh, the CEO pay, which is just, you know, it, 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 it's not going to be, it's not a revolution, but it's, uh, uh, we're making more progress, for instance, in California that they probably, that, that their bill is being introduced yeah. there. And so a lot of these things are going on in, in many places. So uh, I'd like to go back to the minimum wage that Sharon raised. So um, the, st the state that raised its minimum wage in the elections last year was Arkansas. 
At the same time, it unseated a Democratic senator and shifted that seat to the Republicans. Mm -hmm. The minimum wage was not raised by the state legislature in Arkansas. It was raised by referendum. And it shows the disconnect between popular preferences about what's fair and what happens when those preferences have to get filtered, which was the subject of your 15 minutes, in, in legislatures. So, um, so one way you can get change in, you know, a lot of states have a referendum process. That's something also, uh, also to think about. And, and a lot of these changes in minimum wages have been done through, through referendum. At the federal level, um, unlike some other countries, we don't have that, that possibility. My guess is if you had a national referendum on raising the minimum wage, it would pass. Mm -hmm. All right, we have two more questions. Uh, I wanted to speak just to this same point that Dr. Rosenthal just broke up, which is brought up, which is, uh, oh, I'm in the, con in the continuing education program and a lifelong learner at Columbia. But the issue is we don't have a representative democracy anymore in this country. We have a plutocracy. And there is this disconnect between the voters and their representatives. And it seems to me that the average person has come to your same point, which is they're totally pessimistic about being represented by their representatives. So where have we lost our democracy? That is, now we have 750,000 people for each person we have in the House of Representatives. So how can that be a person who's represented by the average voter? You're left with, with this kind of thing you just talked about, which is voter referendum, as a way to get policy through. Because the representatives are elected by the rich folks and the corporations and Wall Street, but the average voter has no more faith in the democracy. So are we then left with changing an institution as embedded as our way of representing people in this country and, and taking back, becoming a democracy for the first time in, in many centuries? Or, I mean, how, how does this, how, how do you get to be an optimist from your pessimist? Because until you change, I don't think a lot of the voters will even participate in <coughs> in representative government, again, because they're totally pessimistic. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not clear what can be done in a non-revolutionary environment. And just an, another example that we did not say, which is the one part of the Constitution that cannot be changed, that cannot be amended, is the part that every state is guaranteed its two senators, mm -hmm. okay? The Senate is terribly malapportioned, okay? You have, you know, Wyoming has as many senators as New York or California, and you can't change that. And that, you know, that leads to a lot of rent extraction and, and everything else. And so, you know, you have, uh, you know, you have a, a Supreme Court that's been controlled by Republican appointees ever since Nixon was president. And so these institutions are, are, are pretty rigid and have negative consequences. And, well, so I remain a pessimist. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hi, I'm Maxime Vitalier, a um, CIPA student. I was uh, thinking that inequality is inerrant um, to human nature, and I don't see zero inequality happening uh, unless you impose it through the socialist communist system, as we've seen in history, was not great results. Um, so I was wondering, just bigger picture, what would be an, an optimal natural rate of inequality? If you want to talk about Gini coefficient, I'm, we're never, never going to get to zero, so just... Uh, if you if you think about technology, go change, to the microphone. Yeah. If you think about technological change, and uh, I sort of disagree with uh, a number of things about the sort of the importance of uh, technological change, there isn't uh, an optimal level uh, of inequality that's sort of you know a universal constant. Uh, as uh, as the economy is changing, uh, it's sort of natural to see that uh, uh, that uh, inequality may increase for a while, then maybe decline as uh, you know technology move, moves around. And uh, sort of just to pick up on some of the things that, uh, uh, that, were, uh, that, that were said uh, before, uh, so, um, 
when you think about skill bias, technological progress, uh, you can think about like the, the way economists used to analyze it uh, was uh, to think about uh, college educated versus non college educated, sort of two big skill groups. Um, if you look at the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years, uh, uh, you can sort of pick professions that uh, uh, that are sort of don't easily fit into that categorization. So one profession would be lawyers. That's a, that's, a, uh, that's a profession that's been going through a lot of changes. It's not keeping up with other high income professions. Uh, now why is it not keeping up with high income professions uh, or you know, high, highly educated professions? It's because even within uh, this highly educated uh, uh, profession, you can have a lot of technological change. You used to need a lot of contract lawyers to, uh, to sort of uh, go through the discovery process when there was a big lawsuit. Now that's, done, that's being done by, uh, by computers. Now, that's a technolo technological change that sort of, uh, that's happening at the top of the distribution. It's no longer, you know, it's no longer about uh, you know, uh, people who, who don't have, uh, you know, Math education, or uh, who don't have, uh, who have only you know, basic skills versus people who are very, very highly educated. It's sort of uh, a change that's sort of uh, that's happening at a very, very, very different, uh, very different part of, uh, of of the distribution. Now, you go forward. You know, that's generating inequality. Uh, you go forward. You know, by I don't know, 20, 30 years. Do you think that uh, that? Uh, uh, Unemployed lawyers uh, are going to remain unemployed. Or, uh, are they going to find out some other ways uh, to productively uh, use their talent? You know, I suspect they will find some other ways to productively use their talent. So, uh, you know, this process inequality is sort of not a constant. It's sort of it's something that's changing, and especially when uh, when you have uh, rapid technological change, it's something that's uh, that's evolving. All right. Well, on that note, let me thank you all for coming. Let's thank the panelists uh, for a stimulating discussion. And uh, let me thank the staff of the Central Global Economic Governance for putting this together.